Thank you so much for coming to another event of the German Symposium this year. We are looking forward to a panel with Otmar Issing, the former chief economist and member of the board of the European Central Bank, with Lord Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England and the chairman of its monetary policy committee. He was also appointed as a life peer in the House of Lords. And Charles Gotthard, former member of the monetary policy committee of the Bank of England, and he, had, he has been the, in a, a professor for banking and finance at LSE. Don't tell the other panelists, but this is one of my favorite panels tonight, and I'm very excited about it. They will speak on the topic Germany and the UK, different visions on Europe, and at the end there will be a book selling of Mervyn King's new book. I already got a copy, um, and I'm very excited to read it. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, we are a group of elderly monetary economists. I think you would call us the M70 plus. But we're going to start this evening with Otmar uh, giving a presentation, a short presentation, about his, his approach and views on this general subject. Otmar, over to you. Charles, thank you. I think for me it would be more appropriate to talk about a veteran of monetary policy. So it looks like a German invasion here. And uh, <laughs> uh, I've seen with the weather today how they treat invaders. Uh, it was a bad experience. But let me come to my short contribution. Let me start with a reference to a personal experience. It was in 1956, you all were not born yet, when a student with very little money arrived by ferry and had a rather unfriendly encounter, unfriendly not from my side, with the British Immigration Authority. After having waited for hours, I was finally allowed to enter the United Kingdom with a statement in my passport not allowed to enter any employment, paid or unpaid. Although I finally made it, I felt humiliated as a foreigner from a country against which hostility still prevailed. Let me immediately add that this was my first and last unpleasant encounter experience with British authorities. At that time, I came from a country which had partly repaired the ruins of the cities, but much less so healed the scars of the memory of the atrocities of the Nazi regime and the humiliation of a lost war. I admired the grandeur of imperial London. I enjoyed hospitality from wonderful people and at the same time discovered a huge gap between British self-consciousness and German inferiority complex. The German attitude was familiar to me. It took me longer to fully understand the fundament of British mentality of superiority. Of course, a glorious past, the cradle of democracy, but more important, what about the future? Until today I wonder what the relevance of this little piece of water between the island and the continent might be. Sixty years have passed since. And a lot has changed. Germany developed into an economic powerhouse, whereas Britain for many years was on a declining trend before it became successfully again. For a long time, Germany recovered from the total collapse, morally and physically, by its economic success, which was worldwide called as the so-called Wirtschaftswunder. After two currency reforms within one generation, the stability of the Deutsche Mark was the symbol for the re-emergence from misery. As Germans soon started to spend their holidays abroad, the appreciation of the DM brought about more than economic advantages. Whereas a German student in 1956 still had to pay almost 12 DM for a pound sterling, this relation had fallen below 3 DM at the end of the existing existence of the currency in 1998. 
and convertibility had arrived much earlier for the DM. I remember that while skiing in Austria in the 60s, where I had a harmless collision with an English skier, knowing that he was allowed to get only a very low amount, I think it was 50, 50 pounds, <coughs> for an exchange, we immediately agreed that I should pay for the beer. Today, Britain is again in the position of a country with higher growth. Unemployment is low in both of our countries. However, Germany has been complacent in the environment of good economic results and even redressed the reforms of the Schroeder government, which were the cause of overcoming the former weakness. Western European integration for Germany was much more than economic success. It was the ticket for entry into the camp of Western democracies. As Winston Churchill had envisaged in his famous speech held at the University of Zurich in September 1946, reconciliation between France and Germany was at the core for peace and welfare in the post-war period, whereas Britain would and should stay out of what he coined the European family. Today, this characterization is probably especially relevant. For Germany, European integration in first place was always a political project <coughs> combined with emotions which now undergo a hard test. In contrast, the UK attitude towards Europe was always pragmatic and rational. At the occasion of the annual meeting of the IMF in 1995 in Madrid, I had the completely unexpected privilege for a long bilateral talk with Margaret Thatcher. One remark by her exactly addressed this aspect when she told me, you Germans are somewhat strange people. When I enter discussions and negotiations, I always make clear what our interests are, whereas Chancellor Kohl would always start with reference to European goals. She was puzzled by this German behavior, the more at this weakened Germany's negotiation position. We know what the source of this German attitude is. Germany has to live with its past. But I'm afraid that trying to exploit Germany's collective guilty conscience even 70 years after the end of World War II could badly backfire one day and stir up nationalistic prejudices on all sides. How vivid memories still are, I learned at the occasion of a speech I gave in London in October 2001. I was at that time a member of the executive board of the European Central Bank. An article in the Times said, I quote, Professor Issing is one of those Germans who have friendly but serious faces. <clears throat> at first, Still the quote, I thought he reminded me of James Mason playing a rumble in the film. But I concluded that he actually looks rather more than Rommel himself. <laughs> Considering the respect Britain Britain shows for Rommel, I couldn't complain before I read the next sentence. I quote, he was speaking at the banqueting house in Whitehall standing in front of the window through which Charles I stepped to the scaffold on January 30, 1649. You might not believe anymore, but there was a time when serious discussions here in Britain considered the pros and cons of joining the Euro. Whereas Chancellor Kohl called the introduction of the Euro a choice between peace and war, Former Finance Minister Gordon Brown's five conditions were seemingly an expression of pragmatism. In reality, it was a hardly disguised no. Behind this approach, you can discover an old English tradition. You have only to listen to Hamlet, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. I wonder what the impact of this traditional thinking is if it comes to the referendum in June this year.
<laughs> Will the known or perceived ills of staying in EU outweigh, outweigh the unknown ills of leaving? There is hardly a country in Europe in which the praise of British pragmatism is stronger than in Germany. We Germans have any reason to see the risk that with Brexit, Europe, more precisely the European Union, we lose an indispensable partner in the fight against protectionism, bureaucracy and centralization. Unfortunately, these principles are less popular in Germany than the warning against the risk of Brexit might indicate. In this context, it is interesting to note that former economics minister Ludwig Erhard, the father of the German recovery after World War II, was concerned that forming a European economic community might foster protectionism and end in a kind of European fortress. He would have preferred a free trade area including the United States. However, Chancellor Adenauer's priority was political integration, a position which finally prevailed. It remains an open question whether such a pure free trade area would have survived all past and would stand future shocks. There is a chance that the negotiations on the conditions to convince British voters to stay in the European Union might strengthen the rationality of the discussion on pros and cons, on national interests which in the end should play the decisive role. While saying this, I cannot hide the emotional side of my European attitude. As an economist, and therefore a representative of what was called a dismal science, I am trained in rational argumentation. However, my emotions apply for a Europe of peace and freedom in which people can travel freely, in which our children and grandchildren can study here in London, in Paris, Berlin, or any other university in Europe. This emotional side coincides with my rational preference for the four freedoms, free movement of goods and services, capital and people. It will be hard but unavoidable for safeguarding the principle of free movement of people to find a solution to handle the immigration problem. When it comes to true friendship, emotions are key if not everything. Perhaps even in the relation between British people and Germans, there is more than pragmatism on both sides. Back from my days as a student, I have learned the importance of the history of an island always having defended her shore. However, remember 1066, when the Normans conquered the island. There is a saying, Britons and Germans like each other but unfortunately not at the same time. <laughs> if we cannot trust the fragility of love, we should rely on the sound fundament of common interest. There are many more issues, of course, to discuss. Uh, in first place, the migration refugee problem, which is for Germany the biggest challenge, even greater than uh, the reunification. <coughs> Uh, or take, uh, for example, the recent report of the five presidents uh, designing a future for the European Monte Union going in the direction of a political union. But I would stop here. It was just trying to give an introduction and to, to stir our discussion to which I am looking forward. Thank you. century was not a, a happy experience. It started in many ways surprisingly similar to the way it ended. The birth of economic growth, self-confidence, and a belief that international relationships would be successful. What came in between, of course, was extremely painful. One of the great museum directors of this country, Neil McGregor, at the British Museum and a friend of mine, has tried over many years to try to educate the British public into understanding what the attitude of Britain towards Germany was a hundred years ago. Then it was impossible to be a professional economist without speaking German. Keynes has a rather moving description of the need.
need to merge German and indeed other continental languages in order to be an economy. Uh, but it goes deeper than that. Uh, the German culture was thought to be central to the experience of being a serious and intellectual person in Britain at the beginning of the 20th century. What happened since has altered the education of most British people so that today they need to be reminded of the importance of the height of German culture, even though we see it in our concert halls and in our books and museums. <coughs> that friendship has been crucial. The issue, however, is what it means for our economic relationships. Probably no country has done more to try to create an atmosphere and conditions for peaceful integration Germany. And it did so not in order to make Germany important, but in order to secure the basis for peace and lasting security. What has happened, contrary to the wishes of Germany, I think, is that the experience of being in the Euro area has made Germany to become very evidently the most powerful and economically prosperous of the European countries. This was not sought by Germany, and it has created quite a serious problem. When there are difficulties in the Euro area, not only to other countries in the Euro area, but many economic powers outside, not least the United States, put pressure on Germany to resolve the crisis by throwing money at it. That is an approach where people bring pressure onto Germany during the crisis. So this creates, I think, a serious dilemma for Germany. I'd like to pop in a minute to say a few words about it. The euro area was not designed to create an economic bloc which Germany dominated. But the behavior of the other countries in the euro area and the institutions that manage it have led to an outcome where Germany is the dominant economic power and is now expected in large part to pay for it. <coughs> I'm very struck that in the last few weeks, the three key central bank governors in the Euro area, <coughs> Mario Draghi, the president of the ECB, uh, and the two governors of the French and German central banks, have all said that in their view, the future of the Euro area has to be either to go forward and create a European finance minister, which in some ways is a code for saying somebody outside Germany that will decide how much Germany pays to other countries, or has to go back to the original conception of a treaty with a no bailout clause and the stability and growth bank which is actually enforced. The worry that I see in this is that I'm not sure there is any political support outside the committees and lunch groups in Brussels that really favours moving to such a dramatic loss of sovereignty as giving the power to set expenditure taxes to some bureaucratically chosen European finance minister. I see no support for that. And the first approach actually failed in the first 15 years of the Euro area when politically the decision was taken by the biggest countries to ignore the implicit terms of that treaty and the stability of the roadmap. And I think what worries people in the UK is that the way in which Europe operates, and there's a very good example here in terms of the constitutional position of making transfers from one country to another. When the European Central Bank said after Mario Draghi's speech <coughs> that he would do whatever it takes, the question was, okay, so what is it that you would do in order to meet the objective of doing whatever it takes? And the solution that was found was so-called outright monetary transactions. These were purchases, <coughs> selective purchases of government bonds, where essentially the ECB would buy the bonds of countries whose sovereign bond yield had gone up most, hence giving them a funding problem. I think on any common sense definition, those transactions violated the no bailout clause in the treaty. And the German Constitutional Court was 
put in an awkward position and raised questions about this and handed it on to the European Court of Justice, which in turn made a most peculiar judgment, which in essence said, if the ECB feels it wants to do something, then that's okay by us, which is not the normal way in which a constitutional court interprets a treaty or a constitution. And now it's back in the hands of the German constitutional court. It will be interesting to see how they wriggle on the hook of this particular problem. But I think the big challenge for Germany, it's a question I've put to Othmar, other countries seem to me to be going down the road of saying, in the end, and some have been quite explicit about it, in the end, either this thing is kept going by Germany paying whatever it takes to keep the rest of us out of trouble, or Germany will be held responsible for the failure of the euro. This is not, it seems to me, a very fair outcome of the position that Germany took initially which is to sacrifice a lot of its economic position of power and its currency, which mattered more than anything else, in order to create peace and stability in Europe. And this is a very unstable position, and I do not know how, how it will end, but I don't think it's in a happy position now. Of course, the relationship between Britain and Germany as a bilateral one goes far beyond concerns about this. It's something which has been there over many years, the sense of fair play, the sense that even though we might be competing with each other, say, on the football field, we do so in ways where we respect each other. Uh, and that is a long history and tradition. I don't see that the friendship between Britain and Germany and the respect which we have for each other's traditions, political, cultural, literary, sporting, is in any danger. What is in danger is in trying to find a way in which we put that into some constitutional framework that both sides find acceptable. And that's going to be the challenge, I think, for the future. Perhaps I might start by saying that there have been occasions on which the Germans and the British have liked each other at the same time. I've actually just been reading what I regard as a most excellent book. It's about Waterloo, and it's by Cornwell. And it, it shows how the relationship between Wellington and Blucher uh, was in very successful and brought about the final uh, defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo. And I do recommend that to all of you. Um, I agree in some ways with both with Mervyn and, and with Otmar. Uh, Mervyn, I think, is outlining the difficulties of having a single currency in a system without a single fiscal system and without a single overriding uh, political unification. And I think that these are very large. Um, I don't think that it is actually necessary to go quite as far as Mervyn indicated. Uh, one of the uh, occasions in my life uh, which I found particularly interesting uh, was when uh, after the introduction, or not the, of the single currency, uh, around uh, 1990, I forget the exact date, uh, the European Commission decided to uh, establish a committee, uh, including both officials from the Commission itself and outside experts, to discuss what was necessary, the minimum necessary, uh, of fiscal uh, interaction to enable the single currency to operate. Uh, we produced a report, which has been largely forgotten, um, which uh, indicated that one of the things that was necessary was whenever you had a part of the single currency that was 
in particularly difficult conditions, that there should be a transfer to it from the others. But it was whenever any country was out of line with all the rest, so that when Germany was having particular difficulties, there would be a transfer to it, and vice versa, when any other country. Uh, so that it was an attempt to deal with asymmetries in a symmetrical sense. Because you could deal with conditions when the whole of the uh, Eurozone was in difficulties uh, through a common monetary policy. Now that report was actually pigeonholed by the law, uh, I think mistakenly, uh, at the time because he was trying to get a larger uh, European budget. And he was trying to raise it from, I think it was 1.4% of European GDP to something like about 1.8%. And we were arguing that a properly designed fiscal transfer mechanism, which was not consistently from Germany elsewhere, but was, would be to protect whichever country was, or which indeed whichever region was most in trouble, um, could be done if it was focused for as someone under 3%. And he thought that that large number would scare the horses. That was, that proposal was not acted upon. And I think the Bail Otmar and Mervyn are correct to say at the moment, there is no indication of any such proposal really coming forward. And very little idea that there will be uh, a significant move uh, in the Eurozone towards a single fiscal or a single political system. And that makes the adjustment mechanism in the Eurozone very problematic. I don't think that that necessarily affects the UK in its relationship, uh, because we are not part of the Eurozone. We have much more flexibility. Um, and it doesn't seem to me that uh, the problems of the Eurozone, and they persist, uh, merit the UK trying to tear itself away from Europe. Uh, in my view, any such attempt uh, would be have very difficult, unfortunate implications, primarily for the UK, as a UK citizen, that worries me most of all. Um, the latest figures, polling figures, suggest that uh, in Northern Ireland, the proportion of voting for Remain is over 70%, nearer 75 uh, In Scotland, it is over 55%, and uh, probably nearer 60 And in Wales, it is probably well over 50 So that if we were to leave, it would be England <coughs> leaving the EU against the wishes of the other parts of the United Kingdom. And I just worry whether the United Kingdom would remain united if it was to leave on the basis of a purely English vote. Um, as you know, there are already suggestions uh, by the SNP that if Scotland votes to remain and England votes overwhelmingly to leave, so we leave, that there would be another referendum. I think find the, the likely condition of Ireland, both north and south, uh, after that event, extremely troubling. I think that Otmar has indicated very clearly uh, that if the UK was to leave, um, that that would be bad for Europe as a whole, for the reasons that he set out so very clearly and lucidly. And I think that that is also true. Um, so it seems to me that a vote to be on, if you like, wider political grounds is a lose-lose vote, even if the situation is such that there are continuing difficulties, particularly adjustment difficulties, uh, within the operations of the single euro currency itself. But maybe you <coughs> can respond now to both those ideas. Both those uh, interventions. Uh, a few remarks, first on what you have said and to some extent it coincides 
which uh, your ideas uh, tells. Um, you said what the union was not designed, designed to give Germany a leading role. It was the opposite. It was rather the opposite. Uh, before I was at the Bundesbank at that time, and there was a saying in Paris that our multi policy is produced in, in Frankfurt. And for a country like France, this was hard, hard, hard to digest uh, over time. But that's, so uh, for many, the idea was uh, that was the best way to get rid of the dominance of the Bundesbank. So uh, uh, it turned out uh, and the disappointment, of course, was uh, even greater against those expectations. Uh, just to add on a personal note, uh, I was part of this uh, transfer of Bundesbank tradition to, to Europe. So uh, this is the first thing, the point. The next point, uh, Mervyn, and here you refer to this um, statement of uh, French and uh, Germans uh, on the European finance minister. By the way, uh, Jens Weidmann, uh, when he discovered uh, the reaction to this statement, he uh, retreated uh, as much as he could, but because I was very surprised when I read it. Um, and the key point is the key point is the following. Uh, it was here in London at the Institute of Economic Affairs in 1995-6, about that. Uh, uh, I published a paper, gave a speech a paper, and uh, the question was, uh, come political union through common currency. And fortunately, in the last moment, I discovered I had forgotten the question mark. Uh, because it was an old idea by Jacques Rieff, uh, written in 1950, uh, saying, uh, L'Europe se fera par la monnaie, ou nous se fera par. We, we get Europe by money, or we, we will not get it. It was the idea that a common currency, a single currency, would work as a pacemaker towards political union. Now we see the impact of the euro is rather the opposite. It's rather the opposite. So against this background, any move in the direction of political union via fiscal union is for me the most dangerous path to follow. Because people will not accept it. Uh, Germans will not accept it uh, to pay for that. Uh, others will never be satisfied with what is in the, bo in the box. Uh, so uh, the idea of uh, creating a fiscal union and uh, European finance minister whatsoever uh, it finally we lack the needed democratic legitimacy. And this is key. You know, this country when the uh, competence on taxes and public expenditure was taken from the king to the parliament this was the cradle of Western democracy, and I think this must be applied in Europe. We cannot, uh, and in so far I mentioned, we cannot try to get political union through the back door of a kind of fiscal union without democratic legitimation. This is a real threat, and uh, beyond economics, this is a threat also in so far. Um, <coughs> You, you have the sentence, neighbor make good, fences make good neighbors. I'm not in favor of erecting uh, fences, but bringing people too close, closer than they wish to be in political terms, is uh, doomed to fail, lead to disaster. So I think we should, should do everything to stabilize the present situation, and I agree with both of you that I think uh, German-British relation, even after what I hope doesn't uh, happen, uh, exit of uh, Britain could be even stronger than uh, within, because we are part of the same tension sometimes. Sometimes, and there's a uh, little evidence of that. You mentioned Neil McGregor. He's now the chairman of uh, the new museum in Berlin. Uh, so uh, this shows that the, this cultural uh, the relations ties uh, bind together uh, beyond uh, quarrels about uh, details of 
the fiscal policy. So can I make two, two points and then tell a story? Um, the first is that Bob Moore is absolutely right about the dangers of trying to force political integration at a pace faster than people want to go. We have no idea what our great-great-grandchildren would choose to do. If maybe they will want to live in a single European state, maybe they won't. But we don't need to decide that today, and it's not for us to decide. What is important is that bureaucrats around the world do not <coughs> go further than they have a legitimate mandate for. And I think Omar is absolutely right on that. The second point, uh, Charles it, it made a very important point here. The euro area and membership of the euro is a different question altogether from membership of the European Union. It is not the same issue at all. And indeed, within the debate in the UK, both sides of the argument in terms of whether the UK should stay inside the European Union or not, both sides agree that we should not be part of the euro. So these are quite distinct questions. The story, I'd like to say something about the day when Otmar and I met. Because although to us it seemed like only a short time ago, very few people in this room were probably born. Uh, some might have been. Anyway, 1992. And th this, I think, goes to the need to understand where the monetary policy and the debates on it came from in Europe at the time. In 1992, European countries were all in the exchange rate mechanism, which was a sort of fixed exchange rate mechanism, an uncomfortable halfway house between floating exchange rates and a monetary union. And um, Britain was in some difficulty because after German unification, the increase in demand that took place, it was pretty clear that if Germany had had a floating exchange rate, the exchange rate would have gone up in order to cool and dampen down domestic demand. Uh, to ensure that there wasn't inflation in Germany. And that was pulling up the Deutsche Mark and other countries being linked to the Deutsche Mark, their currency was being pulled up, well, constant to the Deutsche Mark, but we had to follow the interest rate policy of Germany. And Germany had to raise interest rates to damp the domestic demand, given the exchange rate could free. So interest rates in the UK were high, and we had a deep recession. And it was very clear that there was a political impossibility of carrying on imposing a level of interest rate <coughs> which was going to cause deep damage to the economy and war and anything else very politically unpopular. And Alan Bard, who was at the Treasury as chief economic advisor, and I were sent to, to Frankfurt, to the Bundesbank. And the background, of course, was, and this is the, the key point to understand, so different from today, virtually every evening on the BBC News, the lead item was what is happening in the Bundesbank. And you'd see pictures of the Bundesbank as the lead picture on the television news because monetary policy was made in the Bundesbank and no longer in London. And this was regarded as a very difficult and serious thing. And every night you'd see someone with a microphone speaking outside the gates of the Bundesbank with that long drive in the background to the building. Um, and uh, this was something which was you know, clearly part of the, of the political firmament. And the question was, you know, could this continue or not? Anyway, Alan Bud and I were sent to Frankfurt to try to persuade Otmar, in particular, that the 295 exchange rate was the right exchange rate. And it's perfectly appropriate, and there should be no deviation from it. And Germany should do everything it could to try to support this exchange rate, oblivious of what might happen in the financial market. And you know, Alan and I turned up, and we had lots of coloured charts. Not one was very polite, but frank, coloured charts do not override a coherent economic argument, which was, as Otmar politely pointed out to us, that exchange rates sometimes go up and they sometimes go down, and 295 might be the right exchange rate one day, but not another. And frankly, this week, 295 didn't seem to be the appropriate rate. And it was a most extraordinary day because uh, we turned up classic. You know, British tax. We turned up on the day when the Bundesbank Council would have an emergency meeting to ratify a provisional decision to lower the interest rate reached in a political agreement the day before. Never happened before 
in the history of the province bank. So this was a pretty extraordinary morning. And there was a lot of excitement in the Buddhist bank as Alan and I wandered around, you know, marveling at all this. And um, Italy is about to crash out of the exchange rate mechanism. Uh, and even physically, the thunderclouds were crashing above the Buddhist bank. You could hear the thunder and lightning as we arrived. It was certainly rather esque in the extreme. Um, and what it demonstrated was that a fixed exchange rate system, which was a halfway house, certainly couldn't work because every time a British politician said, we'll do whatever it takes to keep the parity at 295, what they meant was, since we're not prepared to do whatever it takes, we'll say so instead. <laughs> and that, I think, is a lesson that could yet come back to be an important question for the ECB. Because when Mario Zaghi made his famous speech in London, which I was chairing the session in which he spoke, and he said, we'll do whatever it takes. Actually, he has no mandate to do whatever it takes. Because to do whatever it takes is going to require some difficult decisions by politicians, which have not been given to him. And so that is a, a question which, at some point in the next few years, the markets are going to test. But to come back to the, the basis, I think that, you know, doesn't, I mean, the idea that the UK's decision this summer is the most important issue facing Europe seems to me rather odd. So what I'd like to just ask Bob on the following question. The, the European Union, at least on the other side of the channel, faces two really big major headaches, if not crises. One is to do with the evolution of the euro, how that will be, be performed. And the second is the migrant crisis. And I just wonder whether the laudable aim of the free movement of people, which with smaller numbers is a, a wonderful aspiration, whether it will in fact be tenable to maintain that under the pressure of enormous numbers of people. One of the things that we're seeing, not just in Europe but elsewhere, is that if a government cannot control the total number of people coming into its borders, the population says, well, for God's sake, if you can't control that, what can you do? And I, and, and I think this is not an unreasonable question for people to ask. It's one thing to agree as a matter of principle and an attractive idea of free movement of people. It's another to say that this is something we will adhere to, irrespective the number of people that want to move. Do you think this is something that can be held on? It's a big challenge in Europe now. For me, it's the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge. And uh, uh, as economists, uh, we are we're always in favor of uh, no borders, free movement, uh, of almost everything. Uh, even on pollution, uh, but um, I think the migration issue, and uh, I think you are right to call it not just a refugee problem, but a migration issue. Uh, because if you look to the potential numbers of people in Africa, uh, what we see now is peanuts against uh, what the future uh, might bring. Uh, so uh, it is impossible to keep this principle of being in front of people. Uh, within the European Union, uh, it, it, it had a different meaning anyway. It was free movement of people only for those who were members of the European Union. So this is the first uh, issue we have to uh, um, take account of. Uh, but it's now mixed with, because every country has a different approach, etc. This free movement of people, if at all, could, be, could prevail the future only if the outer borders are controlled, which is the Dublin principle, and if welfare migration is uh, not allowed. Even within the European Union, welfare migration would ruin uh, this principle. Uh, so uh, to, to, to have a common approach to that, 
we are so far away from that, so far away from that. So I'm very concerned about that. But on the diagnosis, I fully agree with you. And um, I never considered to become a politician, but I was never more satisfied not to have become a politician than today. Because for a politician, this is it's a nightmare. Whatever you do, whatever you do, and uh, Chancellor Merkel, with her, with her remark, uh, we can, yes, we can. I think this is, we can't. It's very simple, because it's, for me, impossible. The integration is key about integration in the labor market. This is key. And uh, all experience shows that over time, Germany is craying and shrinking. So uh, uh, selective uh, migration policy would have been the appropriate approach for Germany. But uh, there were the humanitarian ideas, uh, it's wonderful. But uh, initially, from Syria, there were coming doctors and architects, etc. Uh, but now, uh, it's very clear that roughly one third are almost illiterate. So uh, how long will it take? Uh, how much will it cost? I think it's impossible. And in the meantime, what's going to be done about Greece? Because Greece is the country which is most economically in difficulty. And now with the Macedonian border being shut, it is the country which is facing the greatest inflow, inevitably, of the migrants, which you really cannot handle. It hasn't got the ability uh, to police its borders in here. So I mean, we've got an immediate Greek problem on our hands. And what's going to happen on that? Um, I think it's, there's any reason to blame Greece for what they have done, what they should have done. But this is minor to the challenge they are confronted with. Uh, this is absolutely impossible for them. Uh, but I think the idea of the Chancellor is uh, that you have uh, control at the outer borders, you have a limited. Uh, how, do you have, how do you have control at the outer borders? when the outer borders effectively are islands about two miles away from where the migrants are. You can't control it that and it, it, It's almost uncontrollable in that sense. So, you raise questions, you have an answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> chairman never have to give answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to give an answer to a yeah. problem. Like no. <laughs> I think there's no, no simple. In Germany, you meet so many people who have a clear answer. Any person who claims to have a clear answer for me is somewhat insane because. I think the key point here, and this is the thing that a lot of the. Um, intellectual elite ignores is that the responsibility of each national government is not to solve the problems of Greece or Macedonia or anyone else, it's to solve the problem of the people who elected them, their own country. And so what you will find is that there are solutions for individual countries in Europe to protect their borders and prevent numbers out of control coming in. And you would expect, and it would not be at all surprising, and it would indeed be democratically legitimate for those countries that can impose controls to do so. That's what you would expect, and indeed, I find it very hard to criticise a government that was responding to the will of its own electorate in this respect. I don't think any of us have an answer to the problems, either of Greece or indeed, for that matter, of Syria. And although you can criticise governments for not doing more, Deep down, in the end, it is not the responsibility of the French or the German or the British governments to take sole responsibility for dealing with the problems in Syria. One, one of the things that always well, that makes me 
worry about these issues is that the areas which are most concerned about immigration in this country are frequently the areas where the immigrants are least well, there are fewest of them. I, London is one of the areas where there are most immigrants. It's one of the areas which is actually most in favor of remaining within the UK. An awful lot of the, the, the immigration story uh, is, I think, uh, really baseless fears. I oh, it's very, that's not true, Charlie. You, there's very you little get a million people coming into the UK. The sort of problem that Germany is facing. That, that's not an irrational fear. If you had children in London who were coming to the end of their primary school career and they can't find places in secondary schools because the government has failed to keep up with an unpredictable increase in population, this is not an unreasonable fear. And I, I, I think that this is exactly the sort of problem that we face, that we've had people who say immigration is good economically. It's a vague general sense it is. But uncontrolled immigration is bound to create the fear that the government is not in control of it, it's not deciding who is coming in, and it simply doesn't know how many are going to arrive, so it can't provide the facilities. That is something which I think is perfectly understandable that people are exercised about, and they will certainly voice that. And I think that governments cannot ignore that, and those that have ignored it, you know, our own government, which made promises on immigration, which it couldn't keep, this is the kind of thing that undermines trust in government when governments promise to do something, knowing that they can't do it. That's what they shouldn't do. But the immigration from the EU is only a proportion of the total immigration. And much of, the, much of the immigration figures are actually students like we've got here this today. Uh, when in due course, many of them uh, return to their own countries. And the, the universities uh, uh, we'll find it extremely difficult to continue uh, if the immigration figures are cut back uh, as tightly as those who uh, wish to leave the uh, EU would like. John, this is the key point. I think the challenge is to find a solution to keep this mobility, studying Europe, etc. Uh, and having mobility of the labor force probably without uh, migration within the European Union. But this is a challenge by itself. And if you burden that with the migration problem, then it becomes insolvent. And I'm afraid that uh, if uh, this problem is not really tapping in the direction which Merwin Merwin indicated, we might lose other freedoms um, on, on top of it. Not because this makes sense or it was intended, but as an unintended consequence. We, we haven't really, and you haven't really, and Otma, do you think that the, you, you, you've excluded a shift towards greater fiscal union. Without that, given the stresses that we've had and which are likely to continue in the euro, how do you see that working? How would you make the euro work better? And why do you think that uh, growth in the eurozone has been so disappointing over recent years? The long story, I cut it short uh, with the risk of creating misunderstandings. First, I think the crisis was, apart from the global financial crisis, is self-inflicted by countries. Uh, with wage uh, developments, etc., with violation of the stability and prospect. By the way, I never understood, uh, you mentioned this report back in that the euro started on the 1st of January 1999. Uh, I think if the stability and growth plan would have been taken serious, the implication would have been that the country in normal times would have a balanced budget, and if it would have a high 
that ratio should have a surplus. If this condition would have been fulfilled, the country would have left, have left three percentage point of GDP for its own fiscal measures uh, to deal with a symmetric shock. And by the way, the stability of growth back said, if there is a deep recession, you can go above or below deficit of 3%. So this is more than any country probably has ever applied. We have made studies at the ECB, I think over 50 years, only a few cases in which countries with counter fiscal measures have uh, exceeded the 3% GDP limit. So it's just not true that this was a, a design which couldn't work. Uh, it could have worked. And uh, on fiscal transfers, my point is the following. <coughs> uh, by the way, who would know in this room that Greece, for example, year per year, it's a transfer between 3 and 5% of GDP uh, from the European sources. Would you ever read it in the Financial Times or hear it from Paul Grobman and others? They talk about uh, the Greek Greeks are left alone. They get substantial, and this is fine. It's a transfer, it's decided by parliaments on the national level, on the European Parliament Commission, and this is a transfer from richer countries to poorer countries, in principle. In principle, a lot of money is wasted, etc. Uh, but in principle, it works in this direction. <coughs> the fisc all the fiscal mechanisms, which are also implicit in the proposal of the five presidents, create a fiscal transfer mechanism which is triggered by bad macro policies. Take, for example, uh, the idea of having a European uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, you get European support if you make bad labor market policies. This is this is the wrong incentive. It's the wrong incentive. And for example, the Slovaks complain uh, that they have lower standard of living than the Greeks, and they are forced to contribute to this implicit transfer mechanism. So I think this is a misguided idea. And uh, I know I uh, I have not uh, read all the. They are wonderful designs by our uh, brilliant uh, economists with all caveats, etc. On paper, it all works. In practice, it would always boil down to that the country who is in self inflicted policies gets support. And this is creating moral hazard on a level which is. Why does that not work in the United States? Hmm? Why does that not work in the United States? And why does Alabama? not take up much more sort of risky policies because there's you know the insurance is paying from Washington. And I when Alabama gets into difficulties, they get transfers from Washington. No, they get transfers via the social security system and the tax system and it's one country. It's one country. The, the mechanism here in the, the Euro area cannot be applied in, in the same way. But I mean in Germany there's the the whole process of transfers between your, your lander, and if one lander gets into difficulties. Now this is a mess. Hmm? This is a mess because <laughs> <laughs> this is a mess if, um, yes, it happens from Bavaria, if, if Bavaria <clears throat> increases its tax revenues uh, by one euro, 80% of the additional tax revenue goes to other countries, uh, states. Uh, this is a, a misguided mechanism. And the idea to export it to Europe uh, is, is, a, is a crazy idea. <laughs> we should reform our, we should reform our <coughs> system. We should I, think, yeah, I think there is a fundamental difference, too, between one country and the regions within it. The democratic legitimacy in electing one government. And a Euro area of different sovereign governments struggling and moving towards perhaps greater political integration, but not there yet. Anyway, the one thing we do know is that the only person I would trust to be a Euro area finance minister is Ot Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> so if I was still in, in, in the business, it would ruin my chance. 
<laughs> that be good. <laughs> Murray King suggested that my eating should be the European Finance Minister would keep this idea. <laughs> We've got about half an hour left. Are there any questions from the audience that you'd like to? Left at the back. You'd like to stand up. Just to clarify another point on migration and um, school problems in London. Yes, there are huge um, shortages of school places. That is primarily due to a recent in-migration. The big driver of the population change in London has been a higher birth rate, which might well be second generation immigrants, but it was predictable. So I think that the movement has been a little bit pessimistic in thinking that we can't cope. We, we could have coped, we just feel the bad. Well, there's a difference between whether we could cope and whether we are coping. Uh, maybe if you've been in charge of it, we would have coped. We're obviously struggling now. But I think the issue here is not so much what's happened so far, but what would happen if there was a significant wave of migration in it. And I think the idea that the European Union could accept migration on the scale that looks likely, particularly if Europe were to give the impression that it welcomed all migration and that this would be in some sense rationed around the European Union is something that is guaranteed to create serious political hostility and it's not a very sensible way to go and I think it's very striking that the tone of the German government in the last six months has altered radically in terms of the numbers that they envisage moving in. Um, so next question was, was one um, thank you for your talk. I'm a graduate student here at LSE. Um, my question is for Mr. Rissing and uh, Lord King. Um, Mr. Rissing, you talked about uh, Helmut Kohl, who tied the future of the Euro to peace and war. And we've also heard similar comments from Mrs. Merkel, uh, who said in 2009 and 10 that if the Euro fails, then Europe fails. And I have to say, I think this, um, this connection is quite peculiar because it suggests that the idea of Europe or the European integration will fall apart once we don't have a euro. So my question would be, what, what, what's your view on this notion that if the euro fails, the euro will fail? Short answer is I fully agree with you. Europe is more than the euro. There is one part of truth in this remark by Mrs. Merkel. Uh, if the euro would collapse and fail, it would be a political disaster. Uh, how to manage that would be very difficult. <coughs> so, if the euro is now here, uh, we cannot go, just go back and say, it was a bad idea, uh, let's go back to square one. Uh, so it would create a, a lot of political difficulty, difficulties. And in this context, it would certainly uh, hurt the relation between France and Germany, for example. In so far, uh, there is an element of political uncertainty in that. Uh, in so far, European relations are threatened uh, by the risk of the collapse of uh, the euro. But uh, I think if this were all about Europe, it would, uh, it would be really uh, a sad situation. I think uh, I, I, I agree with you. The, sh the Schengen area is much closer to the potentiality of the collapse. How serious would that be, either politically or economically? <coughs> uh, today I arrived from Frankfurt. Uh, I had to show my passport in the uh, city airport. It took 10 seconds. Uh, so uh, it's easier to go to Spain and not show my passport. But this is this is not relevant. I think for business uh, and commuters, etc., uh, it's raising costs, no doubt about that. Uh, but I think we, as economists, we are used uh, to weigh the advantages, disadvantages of solutions. And if we need border controls for the migration problem, I think we have to. Uh, take, take the costs of uh, some 
hindrances for free movement of uh, goods uh, as a consequence, but I think this is not something which would is totally, we have, we have had that before. It's a cost, no doubt about that, uh, but I think it can be, in, in relation to keep borders open, I think it's, it's worth the price. So I, I share that view. I think that um, in, in response to your question, Charles, if the Schengen area of the agreement were suspended because of a potentially large number of migrants coming into Europe, people would understand why that was happening. And it would be a defeat in some sense. It would be a rational response to a problem that we hope might be of temporary source. But at least it would be an understandable reaction. I think the sad thing about what's happened in the euro area is precisely that too much is being invested. It, it, the stakes are being raised far too much. There is no reason why Europe can't be a peaceful, prosperous area, even if some countries were to drop out of the euro area. <coughs> and the tragedy would be if, in the wake of some countries withdrawing, the political interpretation of that was such that we lost many of the benefits of other aspects of European integration, such as, I'll give you one simple example. When I was a young academic, it was not possible for a British citizen to have a teaching post in a French university, uh, period. And you would have to go there and, and do a PhD and take the aggregation on so on. The acceptance, the mutual recognition of professional <coughs> qualifications, the exchange of students, the ability to move, if you're a citizen of France or Germany, to each other's country and to Britain to work there, all made a great deal of sense and was a very attractive part of it. But if circumstances change, whether it's migration or whether it's developments in the euro area, what we, I hope we can maintain uh, is the ability to keep those parts of integration which everyone wanted to achieve. And when there was never any disagreement, I think, within the European Union about that. UK was always very supportive. So that degree of cooperation, that degree of quote integration, must be retained, even if other things go. And if people make those other things, those totems, so important that they interpret them as peace or war or the collapse of Europe, I think that gross exaggeration is a big disservice to the cause of European countries working together. Further questions? There's one at the back. Do it. And that one halfway down, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your interesting speech and uh, talk. And I was wondering, both of you mentioned the migration crisis in your the migration problems in your respective countries. And I was wondering, isn't it, don't there are huge differences between the, the, the um, type of migration that you face? I mean, of course, we have uh, migration here in in Britain, but I was, I was wondering because uh, isn't it kind of problematic to play the issue of migration and the issue of refugees as we have in Germany? Thank you very much. I didn't quite get it, but could you rephrase the question as a single said? Sure, I'm sorry. Um, no, I was wondering, there was, it is appeared to me that there was some kind of conflation or confusion between the, the term migration and refugee, I and mean, that was the purpose. But it just didn't mean that it's problematic if you do. I think I would like to, to stress one point, uh, which is uh, due to the German past, which to which I have referred several times in my short contribution. Uh, in our constitution, we have an article that, in principle, anybody in the world being prosecuted at home has a right to seek as asylum in Germany. This is due to the fact that uh, the Jews in the not other part of the Nazi regime uh, did not find shelter uh, around the world. Uh, against this background, uh, Germany felt a moral uh, obligation to have this article in the Constitution. Uh, so uh, it, it's violated anyway all the time before, because, uh, so any individual case would have to be judged. Uh, 
um, this creates in the management tremendous problems. But uh, the present problem is not so much that, because um, by the way, uh, this would not a apply for those who come through all the way from, let's say, from Turkey, because uh, these people are always arriving in countries in which uh, they are not persecuted. So it's legally very complex. But again, in Germany, in the public discussion uh, for a great part of the population, this is still felt as a kind of moral obligation, uh, uh, and which makes the discussion and the politics even more uh, complicated. And in two weeks' time, we have two state elections which will, the outcome will be dominated by the refugee problem. And uh, uh, we see now in Germany uh, also, uh, in, in Germany so far we had no relevant extremist parties. Uh, the Nazi party, NPD, uh, got some seats in the past when they more or less disappeared. Uh, disappeared and uh, now this is a threat for democracy also because if, as Mer Merving, I think, uh, has clearly explained what people do expect from their government. And if the government uh, fails to deliver on such uh, fundamental uh, needs of people, then extremist parties uh, will, it's a subsidy, a political subsidy for extremist parties. Take, take France, uh, Le, Le Pen. Uh, in the context of um, the migration problem, uh, there are discussions now even that she might be first in the next presidential election. It goes further than that. Remember Mr. Trump's wall? <laughs> there was another question right at the back. Um, hi. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, on. I'm also a graduate student here at NC. Um, I have a similar question regarding uh, the, the responsibilities um, of the consequences of migration um, in Europe. So you, you brought up um, a point very briefly regarding domestic responsibilities of nations and governments they have uh, towards their constituency, which is obviously true. But I was wondering if you then implicitly mean that a solution towards uh, refugees coming into Europe would be entirely within Europe closing borders. Um, yeah, that's my question. So I think my, I, I don't know what the right answer is for other countries. I, I wouldn't presume to, to give advice, but I think that a government that wishes to take a moral lead in trying to solve an international problem can do so only if it can convince its own citizens that it has actually got control over the numbers of people coming into its country. So on the basis that that government has that degree of control, only then do I think the government actually can exercise its moral responsibility to help other countries and problems, in this case in Syria and the Middle East. The attempt to pontificate about Syria and elsewhere without doing anything about the problems facing one's own country is a classic recipe for demonstrating a lack of concern for the people in one's own country and a cynical response on the part of the electorate. I don't think there is any easy answer to the origins of the migrant uh, and refugee problem. It's very difficult to distinguish at times between economic migrants and refugees. Uh, we haven't succeeded in the Middle East through various interventions over a number of years in making the situation there better. And I think it's very hard to deny that different Western governments in various forms have made it worse rather than better. Um, so the idea that we, are, we can be optimistic about our interventions improving matters seems to me you know, pretty, pretty unrealistic. But I think that if we do want to do something and exercise a moral responsibility and lead, to help other countries, to encourage other countries to deal with the problems at the source of these uh, refugee and migrant problems, we can do so only on the basis of demonstrating to our own citizens that the government here does have control of its own borders. 
And I suspect that if the numbers continue at this rate for the foreseeable future, the next year or two, then it's inevitable that governments will decide that it must take back control of its borders. And that temporarily means that agreements like the Schengen Agreement may need to be suspended. That doesn't mean to say we can't aspire to go back to it once the problem has disappeared and we've gained control over it. But it doesn't make sense just to pretend that since we signed something some years ago in completely different circumstances, that it made sense just to carry on with that commitment, irrespective of the consequences for the numbers coming into the individual country. Really? Just to add to what you just said, to clarify for the German situation, uh, I think we just take the Chancellor, uh, Mrs. Merkel. Her uh, position is. Uh, let's say uh, out of humani humanitarian uh, uh, concerns but her sentence was yes we can uh, these are the two sides you have uh, talked about and the yes we can is now in the test of elections yeah. people don't believe it yeah. The increasing part of the German population is not more any more convinced of that. And then this clash between the humanitarian <coughs> aspects uh, and, uh, of course, who who is not close to tears or uh, if one sees the, 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 the picture, this is out of the question. Uh, but the, yes, we can or we cannot. Uh, this is the other side. The, uh, and uh, there is. Um, uh, there is this dilemma, uh, and uh, then it's the question: What comes first? I must say, though, I'm, I get increasingly worried about what actually is going to happen in Greece and Italy, and they can't stop from coming over to the islands, um, and they get bottled up in Greece. Greece will be in an impossible situation, and Italy may be not far behind. And one of the one of the routes that is likely to develop is that many of the migrants will try and cross the straits between Greece and Italy. Just a word on Italy, Greece. I fully agree with you. They also in the past they have failed almost everything in this respect too. But again, they are now in a situation which is unmanageable. Italy so far. Uh, I think the Italian, I would call it propaganda, has worked. I see it from your remark. Because Italy so far had a position showing the pictures of people arriving in Lampedusa and then bringing them through the train to Germany. Uh, the, the refugees remaining in Italy, it, it's changing now because there are too many, but initially, uh, they needed, it's a bit sarcastic, uh, they showed the pictures of Lampedusa and ministers came etc. and complained. Uh, at the same time, the trains were waiting uh, and they uh, passed through to, to, to Germany. At the risk of being indiscreet, um, there was a meeting between Chancellor Merkel and the Italian Prime Minister where um, she said very gently, she said, no, very impressive, many of these people are coming in. They're obviously very well informed. It's extremely impressive how quickly they seem to get from Italy to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the suggestion was exactly on the lines that you indicated. But I wanted to say well, we should get back to the, the question of the cultural links between Britain and Germany and, and how one of the, the worst side effects of the way the British media treated uh, the consequences for Britain of the Second World War, where um, you know, it, it certainly ended our economic, it, it cemented the end of our financial and economic dominance. And for a number of years, um, British ministers saw their job to manage economic decline. Uh, it was a very pessimistic approach, and it really wasn't until you got to the Thatcher regime and said, look, let us say, let's stop worrying about decline, and now let's be more self-confident. Um, the, 
the links between Britain and Germany on the cultural side you know, were overshadowed. M most British school children were brought up with a very odd view about Germany, and they knew nothing about the great history and tradition of German culture. How many, how many kids in British secondary schools today actually would know who you mean by Goethe? Compared with how many German student, school students would know who Shakespeare was? And I think that those figures, if we had them, would be quite revealing. And it's, I think Neil McGregor's mission to, to try and educate Britain more in terms of the cultural links is very important. And, and we, don't, we shouldn't allow the economics to dominate that. There must be room for, for other things. Um, two observations. Uh, first, um, you started with these cultural ties in the 19th century, which were extremely tight. Uh, Particularly in the royal family. Yeah. They were almost entirely German. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, <coughs> you know this book by Steve Walkers, three or four weeks before the outbreak of the First World War, the British Navy paid her annual visit to Kiel. And the German Emperor came with the uniform of the British Admiral or whatsoever on board of the British flagship. Uh, four weeks later, uh, a war broke out. So um, I, I, I want, notwithstanding all the cultural ties, so, um, I, I, I just make this point. Well, but also uh, notwithstanding all the economic ties, I mean, the argument that was made before the First World War was that it was inconceivable that the countries that actually got involved in the conflict would go to war, because the four great powers were the biggest trading partners in the world. And they were each each other's biggest trading partner. And it didn't prevent the outbreak of the war. It, I, I would, I would, I, my history, memory of history is not is all that great, but there had been platforms before. And Agadir, for one example, and I think that there was at least one or two. Um, uh, John Bucket, the 40 steps. And all of these were interpreted as flashpoints that weren't allowed to get further, precisely because the degree of economic integration was so great. And there was a famous book written that explained that there couldn't conceivably be a war because of how integrated economically the countries were before. Well, there was another book written by, an, I think it was an American economist, who said that no war could possibly go on for more than two months. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my second uh, observation was uh, it was two years after, one, two years after the World uh, Cup in Germany. Uh, I had a, a driver um, here at, in London and uh, very soon we came to football. Yeah, he came from Ghana, and as it happened, uh, the Ghana team uh, participating in this World Championship uh, had his, his uh, location in my hometown, Würzburg. So he said, oh, I've been to Würzburg, etc. And then uh, he said, I was so surprised. I had a totally different uh, view on the Germans. Uh, they were polite, etc. <laughs> Uh, he, 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 was, he was almost shocked by the difference of his previous impression. And of course, at that time, the Germans made good weather, everything worked together. So uh, Germany looked, and Germans looked much better than they normally are. I, I know, but notwithstanding that, uh, he told me that, and he said, I asked him, how come that you had such a bad impression from, from Germany? from Ghana, so he lived, he lived, now, lived for 20 years in, or 10, 15 years in, in, in London, and then I said, uh, probably from newspapers and TV, and he said, you are right. And from now on, I never believe on TV and newspapers. <laughs> I think uh, when I was here as a, a young student in 56, and uh, this experience, I don't know if it's still uh, uh, going on, uh, 
every week, if not every second day. There was a movie of a German prison camp uh, in the Second World War, and uh, the Germans were the stupid, of course, guys. They uh, were speaking German uh, language, which I didn't understand, and they did because they were just shouting. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and uh, the children, it was in the afternoon, etc. Uh, it had a long, long tradition, a long tradition here. Has it disappeared? Well, there are other traditions as well. In Hollywood, for example, all the baddies are English. <laughs> so, um, but I think your friend would have been even more surprised if he'd met the German football team, because he would have discovered a group of people who, on average, were markedly more intelligent than the average English football. That is one reason. That is one reason why German national teams do well in World Cups because they have the ability to go abroad and enjoy being abroad and can play to their best while abroad, whereas every English team has the opposite. So there was a wonderful moment in South Africa when the World Cup was in South Africa. Uh, when, and of course Germany beat England, it was 3-1 in that match. And just before the match, uh, both the English and the German teams had gone to a game park in South Africa. And you could, they, they showed pictures on television, the two teams going on consecutive days to the same game park. And the German team, when they went there, they were looking at the animals, they were you know, pointing, they were discussing in an animated fashion what they were seeing. They were enjoying being in the game park. They were enjoying the experience of being in South Africa. The English team, when they went, they showed pictures of them. Every single English player had headphones on <laughs> <laughs> while they were in the game. And you could see from their body language that the only place they wanted to be was back home in London or Manchester. <laughs> and that is one reason why they perform badly in an international tournament compared with players who are, and noticeably, I mean, it's a different, it's, if you look at the, the structure of the German national team, how it's organized, it is designed for a group of players with a somewhat higher level of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> it was the great German manager, Otmar Hitzfeld, who managed the, cup, the, the World Cup winning side in, 94, in 74 and again in 78. And in 74, Germany won the World Cup on home soil. 78 in Argentina, Germany lost it and didn't play well. And Hitzfeld was asked by a German television. What was the difference between the side that played well in 74 and the side that played badly in 78? And the answer he gave was one word, and it was a word that no English football manager would ever use, which is why most premiership clubs are no longer managed by English. And the word was intelligence. <laughs> and there is a real footballing emotional intelligence required to play anything at the highest level, whether it's football or monetary policy. So we sent our best students here to LSE, right? Yeah, <laughs> To improve the quality of the English. Huh? Absolutely. <laughs> we hope it runs off. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what this implies, but Mer the team that Mervyn is supported forever, now bottom of the Premier League, the team that I've supported forever, now bottom of the Champions. And we both need more German players. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'm afraid our time has actually run out, and, and Lord King has got a another commitment. He's got to move on. But before we end, <coughs> can we thank Otmar and Lord King, Otmar Rissing and Merlin King, in our traditional way? Thank you very much. <laughs>